Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and uh, a very good afternoon everybody. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank everybody for your time, uh, making yourself available, attending, and also continuous supporting the activity organized by MNATD, Marine and Technical uh, Marine and Naval Architect uh, Technical Division, and as well as IEM. Uh, my name is Muhammad Her. At present, I am one of the committee member for MNATD, and I will be the moderator for this afternoon. Alhamdulillah, uh, for today, we managed to bring a special speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Faisal bin Muhammad Ayub. I suppose it's correct. And he will be delivering the very interesting uh, topics, very interesting subject, the evolution of simulator development from historical milestone to modern technology and application. Right, very interesting. Uh, just very quick uh, uh, background on our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Faisal Muhammad Ayyub is an associate professor at the Faculty of Ocean Engineering Technology and Informatic in University Malaysia Terengganu, UMT. He was there since 2008. Uh, at present, uh, he was the managing director of a startup company incubated by UMT called VSG Labs Sinian Berhad. And at present, uh, they were focusing on a few activities such as a creation of vehicle simulator. Mm, this is my favorite subject. Uh, a virtualized learning and as well as product design. Uh, Dr. Faisal obtained his first degree in mechanical engineering from University of Malaya and he uh, proceeded his PhD in mechanical engineering as well from University of New South Wales at Australian Defence Force Academy and his major focus is on ship design particularly in high speed craft. So for those who are looking for good uh, for good speed craft afterward, then you can contact Dr. Uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Ahmad Faisal. Yeah? Right, just very quick in terms of our presentation today, for all attendees, please, re please be reminded that uh, during the session, all of you will be mute. And if there any question, uh, do not hesitate to post your question on the, on the chat box uh, available on your screen. Then later, I will forward the question to uh, Professor Faisal for, 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 for any reply during the Q&A session. Um, we targeting to close uh, this session by 5 p.m. So uh, we have about one and a half hour uh, for presentation and followed by Q&A for another 30 minutes. So I hope everybody is clear. Uh, Prof. Faisal, you look smart today. <laughs> Thank uh, you. You, you I, are looking good as well. <laughs> I, are you married? Yeah, yeah. I have two kids <laughs> and one wife. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, 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 subsequent to this, uh, next, uh, I will off my uh, my camera. Then I will pass to uh, Prof. Faisal to proceed with your presentation. Yep. Please. Thank All you very right. much. All right, thank you so much, uh, IR Momaher. So everyone, thank you for being here. Welcome to the webinar. So I'm going to proceed with the presentation and I will turn off my webcam so you can focus on the content. All right, uh, permission? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk about the evolution of simulator development uh, from historical milestones to modern technologies and application. So this is my second um, IEM uh, webinar presentation. Last year, I was talking about autonomous surface vehicle and how it relates to digital twin. Uh, and this is a continuity of the previous, previous presentation uh, that I de delivered last year uh, within the same seminar as well, uh, like this one. But Today is a bit unique because I'm no longer talk, going to talk about the autonomous surface vehicle, but Today, we are going to focus on uh, operator training simulator, how it had, how it will be developed, how it currently developed, and what is the state of the art. Uh, and you will be surprised that um, at the end of the presentation, um, the operator training simulator will going to be um, 
in unity with the digital twin, something that we always talk about nowadays because we have a very good internet and we have a very good mathematical model and we want to reduce costs while maintaining the well-being of the, uh, the human that working. All right, so next will be the elevator pitch. Why this presentation is very important? Um, we see that billion dollars have been saved by using simulators in the industry. Um, you know, in the airlines training, we use simulators to prevent losing of lives and cargo. In ship navigation, the ship that you see, the cargo ship, uh, the container ship that brings in all those cargo are used. Uh, and we use simulator to train all these operators to prevent losing of lives and also cargo. Um, in plant, um, in petrochemical plants, we use simulator to train people inside the control room to prevent of losing life and also output. We, we don't want to have a very high pressure. Uh, we want to maintain the flow rate uh, and we want we don't want to have any explosion. So um, some other disciplines like medical training and lab training uh, has nowadays moved towards simulator as well because um, sometimes uh, when you try to, um, if we look into ourselves and we try to learn how to drive, um, we go to classes and then uh, once we complete our class, uh, our instructor straight away bring us into the car and then teach us how to drive. Um, so that one is very hard pounding because you never drive a car before. But um, in this perspective on, this, on the simulator, we'll see that there will be an advantage of using simulator before putting the students or the operator to the car uh, or to the machines or to the plant. Now, the common theme prevails that simulators are very effective to ensure the, the well-being of us, the workers, and also the companies, and also to give us cost efficiency. And you are going to be surprised that you might have built a simulator before. Um, if you are graduated in business or if you are graduated in engineering, you might have used or built one. I'm going to talk about that later. And let's dive into the formal introduction. So you have a very strong grasp of what is simulator and you know what are the keywords that you can use afterwards when you when you are facing with the clients or suppliers uh, to talk about um, getting ready to deliver the first gas, uh, to deliver the first ship, uh, the, the maiden voyage and so on. So this is the outline of the webinar. Um, excuse me if I'm talking too fast. Um, I am I here if you have anything that you want to ask question in the middle, you're welcome. Okay, so the outline of the webinar is like this. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce what is the generic defini definition of simulators. And then I'm going to talk about um, operator training simulator. And sometimes it is called multi-purpose dynamic simulator, MDPS, or nowadays, has been close to become a digital twin. So this is the natural flow of the simulator uh, research and also development. Um, and next, some of the keywords on how to how uh, how an OTS or how a digital twin system is being developed. Uh, and then uh, some of the successful case studies of OTS and MDPS, um, modern application of OTS and also digital twin. So this is one of a uh, very interesting part because um, we know when we work in petrochemical plant and there are new people come in with their own experience in their previous plant, we call this as management of change. With management of change, we have new ideas coming in. And sometimes of, when we have management of change, people try to challenge what is the current plant can do. Uh, so challenging the idea of plant can do by increasing the some of the uh, lever or some of the buttons or some of the settings, the flow rate, um, the gas turbines will will introduce higher yield or sometimes going to expose you with accidents. This can happen. So let's look into this. And I'm going to go to some of the go through some of the template examples on the documents. Okay, so um, uh, some of the uh, statement of background just now uh, IR might have um, read some of the biography so I've obtained my uh, bachelor in 2006 mechanical engineering and then I worked two years uh, in plant uh, mostly dealing with structural dynamics uh, I do vibration um, where I go to the plant put a lot of sensors and then get all this um, the readings uh, and then go to back to the lab uh, I model the, all the sensor readings to operational deflection shape, run simulation, and then propose um, further improvement for the rotating machine so that it's not going to vibrate a lot. 
and furthermore, uh, a little bit on the fabrication side. Uh, I worked one year as a control R&D engineer uh, for aircon and water heater projects, but mostly for the uh, the the control parts of the uh, aircon and water heater. And then I, I've done my PhD in mechanical engineering, but mostly for uh, naval architecture, uh, high-speed craft. Uh, in 2011 to present, uh, I work as a lecturer in University of Terengganu. Currently, uh, UMT is also having several startups of several companies that they incubate. One of them is our company, which is VSG, Virtual Simulator Group. Okay, so let's go into the formal definition of a simulator. So, um, when we talk about simulator, probably inside of our mind, we are going to imagine something about a replica of a ship. Historically, yes, it's going to be a very uh, a physical thing that you can touch and you can turn the knobs and um, you can change the settings and things like that. You can have screens uh, and then you can see the reflection uh, of what's happening in your surroundings. Um, some simulator, they have um, the flow rates uh, or the pressure readings. Uh, some uh, similar they have temperature, uh, the speed of the uh, the rotor, uh, what is the thruster at the front and thruster at the aft. So uh, it would be surprising that all of you might have used simulator one way or another. Some of you might have built your own simulator. If you are running business, you use Excel and then you try to project what will happen if you increase uh, production of X and production of Y. And then from there, you can Pre uh, predict what is your um, revenue for that particular month and then the revenue for that particular quarter and that particular year. And those are basically what you do with the Excel is the business simulator. And if you are an engineering student or if you are an engineer, uh, you might do a lot of uh, statics or dynamics calculation, fluid dynamics with your hand or uh, you have hand and paper. And those are basically you try to model the real world reaction before you go to the uh, the real world device. So that model that reflect the real device on your paper is basically a simulator as well. Another version of simulator, if is if we if you are having discussion with your supervisor, for example, and then you have a whiteboard and then several post-it notes or marker pen. And the supervisor will talk about, okay, what is the effect of increasing the pressure on this particular, um, in this particular drum uh, or in this particular flow uh, pipeline? So um, your response will be uh, doing some calculation, increase the some percentage of the lever or the button, and then um, the supervisor will going to respond, yes, yes, you are right. And then this is probably going to be uh, the output. So this is, um, the rudimentary uh, shape of simulator that you, you might have done before is basically a simulator um, and it's not necessarily something that uh, have a big room of a replica, have a nice chair, a gaming chair that you see uh, at home. You have, I think some of you might buy the steering wheel or the gears, things like that. It not necessarily look like that. Uh, so. Simulator is something that you use to test and validate new design. You can evaluate the performance and then you train yourself or your team in a safe and controlled environment. So that is basically a simulator. Now, if you look at the historical part of the simulator, um, the earlier simulator, the physical simulator that we see in the history is reported at, by Royal Aeronautical Society Flight Simulation Group is in 19, uh, 10, 1910. So this is basically the flight simulator being used um, during preparation to the World War. So um, they, they train their pilots using this physical simulator. And this is basically a flight simulator. They used to train pilots and test aircraft design uh, as early as the beginning of 1900. Um, and uh, typically, probably if you look at um, teenagers or um, uh, college students or even yourself you might um, own a driving simulator you install that driving simulator in your computer and probably you have a steering wheel you have steering and also you have gears and you have um, throttle so those are our driving simulator and in in real life we use driving simulator to train drivers in several um, conditions like um, if you if you play truck simulator 
uh, they train you how to drive a truck close to the cliff, uh, how to control that. Even they teach you how to connect your truck with a cargo container at the back. And then uh, industrial simulator, uh, typically to model complex manufacturing or logistic system or in control plant, in the petrochemical plant, we look at the flow rate, the temperature and the pressure. So yeah, now the motivation, why we should use simulator? Um, since we know that we can create our own simulator, be it by white paper and also pen, be it by calculator, be it by um, Excel, be it by sitting down and creating MATLAB, uh, Simulink, um, or building your own 3D simulator. We use simulator because we don't want to destroy the plant. Uh, we can go and increase the pressure uh, and see whether uh, the, the yield we're going to increase um, to increase the rotating machine uh, RPM. Uh, but that comes with a very huge risk. Uh, rotating machines will going to vibrate and it's going to fail. Once it's fail, it's going to build up pressure. Once it build up pressure, you might explode the the whole the whole uh, the whole site. So that is basically a drama dramatization of not using simulator. We use simulator to save costs because you can test new ideas uh, without committing resources to the real plan. And also, you can save yourself. Um, this is for safety. You can test in a controlled environment without risking other people or your equipment. Um, simulator can be easily modified or adjusted to test different scenario or condition. Uh, for example, if you have uh, a ship going to travel at certain speed, what is the effect of the roll and pitch if you if the the wind speed is several knots? Um, yeah. So those are the kind of thing that we need to test. And finally, reproduce the situation, reproduce the sim, uh, the scenario. So, if you have a software can that can always recreate the situation that you want, you can train your team before even go to the real situation. And this is going to be uh, presented on this slide, which is the analogy. Okay, why immersive simulator is very important. It is because um, in teaching we have um, cognitive affective and psychomotor. Uh, we teach uh, cognitive a lot by testing students with tests. Um, we teach and then we test them using pen and paper. However, um, when we try to have students to work in industry, they need to have affective and also psychomotor. Affective it means that uh, penghayatan, which means that they really know what's happening by heart. Uh, so heart is basically affective. Uh, they can predict the mood of the captain, uh, the mood of the helmsman, how to communicate well with each other. From there, we go to psychomotor. Psychomotor is basically movement of your hands and also your body to cater for that particular situation. So analogy, energetically, when you are inside a full maneuvering um, ship simulator like this one, we have uh, pilots uh, that will be controlling the helm. Um, and then you have captains at the back going to give you commands and you have navigator to check the map uh, and propose you what is the next turn, okay? So those are those kind of communication is very important and then that translate to your body language and also translate to your body movement. So from there, you know that you can handle the situation. Like this one, uh, we we have cater for um, a, 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 a group of uh, navigators who want to bring a uh, container ship to a certain port in uh, East Coast. So uh, our simulator has the capability to model the port and then the captain will going to talk to us inside the control room. And then uh, the captain will say that, okay, please increase the, uh, the, the wind speed into uh, three knots, for example. And then when the three knots wind speed is, in, is uh, introduced inside the system, uh, the wave will going to respond with certain wave uh, wave height and then the ship will going to correspond to wave height and then we're going to look whether that particular day with this particular wind speed and temperature and visibility this mission is viable or not uh, otherwise they need to plan for other days so this is one of the advantage of using simulator inside the ship simulator second analogies that i might present here is on the use of flight simulator 
uh, in Subang, you have Airbus A A320. Uh, you can have this experience. Um, it's basically a, a, a replica model of A320. You pay some fee there, and then you can try your hand, <laughs> see how it goes. If you can fly uh, the Airbus, um, can you uh, take off or can you do the safe landing? Um, can you read uh, the roll, pitch, and also the yaw of the aircraft? So those are some of the things that once you do uh, experience the situation, uh, you know that when, it, when the time comes, you can handle it. So this is one of the most important thing about having a physical replica simulator. And uh, the, the next one is the oil and gas simulator, simulation software. So the oil and gas simulation software um, is very prominent for the petrochemical uh, training. I think once I went to UTP and there they, they show us uh, the replica of um, uh, the replica of petrochemical plants with the simulator inside. So they can monitor the flow rate, they can monitor the RPM of the turbine, the RPM, the compressor, uh, all those pressure inside, and they can create the situation where the students need to uh, reflect or uh, take action based on the situation that they are having. Okay, we done with the simulated analogies. Now we are going to go for the components of a simulator. Okay, this is the generic component of a simulator or um, formally we call it Operator Training Simulator, OTS. Uh, so if you look for the word simulator in Google, we are going to find a lot of irrelevant things, mostly uh, that goes to a uh, driving simulator. So it might not going to be um, relevant to you, but if you search operator training simulator, you are going to see a lot of things that relate to our work um, in plant. So here, um, the simulator consists of a control room. Uh, and then you have, uh, this is the control room. So control room typically is uh, far away from the plant. Uh, for simulator, we, we hook the control room to control system. Uh, so control system here, you have um, a fire and gas, a process automation system, okay, and compressor control, CC. And you can also connect the control system to a third party that you develop uh, within within your 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 team, so not necessarily simulator needs to be something that you obtain uh, off the shelf. Sometimes a simulator can be written in a form of a mathematical model, so just uh, it good enough uh, for you to um, to get the feel of what happen if we increase the flow rate or what happen if we turn on uh, the forward thruster uh, and see how what will it responds. And then next is uh, connected to the field. Okay, so co connecting to the field, uh, some of the machines, uh, they come with virtualization or a mathematical model that comes with it uh, to simulate the output. Uh, sometimes you can isolate a pump and then you can, um, you can bypass the pump and create a virtual field so that uh, you don't have to uh, test your idea within the real field. So, field is where the sensor reside to report the data to the controller. All the components here uh, can be modeled using uh, desktops or you can model this using servers. Now, so you, you get the idea of the whole system, how it looks like. It's not necessarily look too, um, too complicated. Uh, this is the three components, the three major components. And you can look at the real petrochemical room, uh, courtesy of ABB. So this is the real control room. I think um, a lot of our friends here that work in petrochemical are very familiar with the control room and how you communicate with control room, whether to, to turn off a certain side of the, of the plant uh, and then uh, do something about it. So this is uh, the real one and this is the simulator one. So it can be um, as complicated as this or you can do a replica just to show the one that most important for you. So um, you, you you don't want to have the mess inside the control room. Control room tend to be um, very clean and orderly. So uh, you can have uh, as real as possible based on your replica. And we want to have the students to really uh, have the feel of how to, uh, to react once the pressure, once the graph uh, or flow rate, once the alarm turn off, 
um, uh, once the alarm set off and how to act afterwards. Okay, now uh, there are several challenges um, in adopting OTS, in adopting operator training simulators. Um, we see that um, in uh, we see that in uh, petrochemical, uh, the operators have started using operator training simulators. Um, and then uh, some of the plants, they don't use that because they are referring to manual book all the time. Okay. Um, and we know that um, when we do turn around uh, in plants, sometimes you change the uh, heat exchanger uh, from company A to company B. And then uh, you get the heat exchanger and then you referring to the manual. Sometimes you might lose the manual or sometimes you need to uh, remove the new heat exchanger and change it to the new one. So we, we see that this is something, yet, uh, something that uh, the user might have the challenge to, to test a lot of new ideas to increase the yield or sometimes going to um, expose themselves to danger by modifying the parameters uh, in the plant. But some of the challenges that we have is um, when delivery of simulator is being conducted, um, the operators will assume that the, sim the, the simulator will going to be ready for immediate use. Uh, it is important to understand that any simulator will require training period that might range from certain weeks to several months. Uh, some of the simulator will going to take about one week to train. Some are will going to take about six months. So this is depending on the complexity of the project. Okay, and some of the adoption of simulator will going to be uh, like this: the dialogue. Um, what kind of simulator that we are going to buy? Okay, we are going to buy Kongsberg, or we are going to buy uh, Wartzilla. Uh, okay, so the such dialogue indicates that um, having uh, an expensive or very popular simulator has become a KPI. So they say that um, if the simulator is expensive or well known, it might be good. Okay. Um, so this is something that uh, we see in our national oil company. Also, they are venturing towards the use of response simulator that is not from Consberg. Uh, for response simulator, for fire simulator, uh, they are uh, subscribing to a new simulator development company uh, that is not um, typical. So, so popularity should not be used as a KPI because um, when adopting an operator training simulator, you should not buy off the shelf and then assume this is going to be working straight away. The best way to adopt a simulator is by having a very close relationship working development between the end user and also the uh, supplier. Next is purchasing simulator without defining clear objective. Okay, um, this is uh, something that we, we we do in UMT as well. When we subscribe to a simulator, uh, there are several modules that we can pick. Okay, some modules will have a uh, container ship. Some modules will have full maps of the world. Uh, some modules have uh, something that we can install new map or uh, new, new surrounding areas inside the simulator. Uh, it is illogical for us to buy a simulator with weapon capability. We don't need weapon, so no need to buy weapon for us. We just want to train our navigator to navigate ports safely and deliver the ship safely, berthing, that's it. So no need for weapons. Um, Therefore, the weapons is a very uh, extreme, extreme point. But my point is, developing a simulator is a customized relationship between end user and also the developer. So we should not overestimate or underestimate the company's need. We need to really ensure the company's need fit with the simulator. If we oversubscribe, the company will going to lose money. So that's the, the, the underlying uh, principle. Okay, so this is some of the standard terms that we use for OTS project. Um, so in, deli de in, in delivery of the OTS, you have uh, a separate room. Uh, a separate room is very important. This is what we call by instructor station, where we have a CCTV inside of the plant. Okay, if you have a replica plant, or if you have a replica control room, we have a, another room for the instructor. So for the instructor, they can 
create scenario that might be something that the student or the trainee uh, or the technical officer need to act upon. Okay. Uh, next term inside an OTS project is run or freeze or record or playback or backtracks. So this is similar to watching a movie. When, when we run a simulator, um, we don't want to record only uh, your movement inside of the control room or how you react to a wave if you're inside a, a ship simulator. We want to uh, pause at certain point and then see what's wrong. Um, if you are overshooting your navigation, we want to pause there and then see what are the things that you activated. For example, um, if you are approaching a port, uh, do you activate your front thrust thruster or you activate your aft thruster or you just rely on your main propeller? Uh, or at that particular position, you can freeze and then discuss with the instructor saying that, okay, probably during this time, I need to be assisted by a tugboat. Okay, so, and then we can backtrack, uh, reverse for a few seconds uh, at the moment where the discussion before the discussion is being done. And then the instructor can, can, um, can spawn or put a tugboat to assist the navigator. So these are very interesting. This is something that we do all the time. And then uh, initial conditions. Um, this is uh, initial conditions where um, we call it IC. All right, uh, this is example of initial condition. Um, it can be in steady state. So steady state means the plant is operating at a steady production. Uh, for example, full production, no problem. Things are running well. For example, the plant is running at 90% capability. Uh, so this is full production at a steady state. It can be um, when you train a uh, a uh, simulator uh, uh, operating operating uh, technician, uh, technician, you can tell them that this is going to be a cold start. Uh, you're going to do um, uh, a starting sequence because the machines has been shut down for a long period of time. Um, this is probably a turnaround uh, situation where uh, the plan has been rested for about three weeks. Uh, there are several changes, major changes, probably reactor, reactor change, probably turbine change. Um, this is cold start. And then warm start. So warm start is basically uh, if you shut down the machine for a few hours, and then we you you maintain the several uh, part, we have uh, several temperature sensor, and then you know that the plant is not yet cold, and then you can turn on the warm start. So this is initial condition for the warm start. A hot restart. Hot restart when the the plant trip, for example, or the sh the ship trip, um, it shut down, and then you need to um to do a hot restart. Uh, and then you hot restart, which means that it's it's still hot, and then uh rest for a short period of time, and then ready for restart. Sometimes you can do initial condition at a low rates. Um, some plants they produce at really low production rate because they don't want to shut down but they just want to proceed with uh, making sure that the flow is uh, stable at the low production rate no need to keep the machine cold make it hot uh, sorry make it warm all the time or generator ready to sink so the power plant has been start up the turbine is a synchronized speed and the generator is to be synchronized to the grid so this is basically a change uh, of plan for uh, probably uh, that kind of situation uh, and then we have something that we call uh, a snapshots. So snapshots is something that um, when we uh, when we freeze and then we save at certain uh, snapshots. So which means that okay, we take a, a break and then we are going to come back after rest. So we do snapshots. Uh, and then next term is a human machine interface. So human machine interface, for example, if you are working in a petrochemical plant, you are going to use process and instrumentation diagram, PNID. So process and instrumentation diagram can be in a printer form, can be on screen. Um, sometimes it's in PDF, but you cannot touch the button on the PDF because it's basically a, a static, uh, a static uh, diagram. But human machine interface is basically when you model the whole plant and you can interact with the buttons. So once you have screen that can be interacted using buttons, this becomes a HMI, human machine interaction. 
or if you don't have a touch screen sometimes you have uh, physical buttons to turn on to turn off um, to turn left to turn right um, so those levers so those are human machine interface okay so so that's the standard term uh, HMI okay next standard terms is malfunctions so malfunctions can be um, can be can be defined into two types of malfunction uh, generic malfunction and also custom malfunction okay generic malfunction is typically for the generic simulator um, so generic simulator you have valve you can have the valve to to fail open to fail close or stuck in a position okay so instructor from the different room they're going to uh, click a scenario saying that uh, sending a uh, making the plant have fail valve and, and then we want to see what will the trainee inside of the control room will do uh, will the trainee uh, immediately shut down uh, the plant or will the trainee take the walkie-talkie and then talk to the uh, plant personnel uh, saying that this is happening uh, the uh, the pressure is still safe for you to do a manual open so things like that communication um, and then we have uh, another generic malfunction it's like a uh, motor failure uh, motor that enable to be started inside of the control room so can we call the personnel and then uh, go into uh, have a check what's happening um, so uh, this is transmitted if you have digital twin you are going to have an online communication with the machines on plan so will that um, uh, the instructor can also do that to measure uh, what will or to train what we operate to do in that particular situation Okay, well, this is for generic simulator, but uh, for custom simulator, they can do a lot of things. We call it bespoke malfunction, which is custom malfunction. For example, pipe rupture, can a pipe rupture, uh, and what is the corresponding uh, temperature for the whole plant? This burst, can there be fire detected at specific plant area? Uh, this is basically for response simulator, where uh, you are going to do a lot of callings, saying that, okay, we need to deploy everyone to uh, the assembly position, uh, make everyone safe, uh, gas leak detected. Uh, so those are uh, uh, relevant for um, response simulator. Next is instructor scenarios. Okay, instructor scenarios is uh, the action or custom action played by the simulator at a pre-specific times by the instructor. So instructor, remember you have instructor in a different room and they have CCTV to look at you and they have uh, several buttons that they can observe what you are pushing. So let's imagine instructor wants to do the following, uh, load an initial condition and then run the simulator for 10 minutes. Okay, uh, and then look at the uh, do communication with the uh, uh, the training uh, at the simulator, and then apply a generic malfunction at the simulator time for ten minutes, and then see how the um, the training will going to react or take action, and then make a checklist, and then apply a custom malfunction. What are the kind of uh, pro, what kind of response that the training will going to do, and then at the time of thirty minutes, freeze the simulator. So this can be saved in the OTS and the instructor can call this at any time and run them to test the trainees. Um, other terms that we have is the type of simulator. Okay, so just now I keep talking about generic simulator and also replica simulator. Now, um, if you are entering a simulator like A320, Airbus A320 simulator, it's basically a replica simulator. Uh, what you see the buttons in the replica simulator is similar to the real A320. So those are replica. But for a generic simulator, it's basically um, it's a simulator that have all the buttons similar to the replica, but not arranged like this is what the replica will have. You know, it's like you are setting your own simulator at home. Um, and it's not, not necessarily similar uh, to the Formula One car in, inside the track. So this is what we call by generic. Now, the, the advantage of generic simulator is very is cheaper than replica. You don't need to, uh, to build the whole room to get the sense of the whole simulator because you just want to be familiarized uh, with the surrounding, for example. Uh, but replica is much more expensive. You might going to spend about 3 million uh, RM now for to complete a simulator project uh, with the air conditioning with the lighting also the buttons and also uh, the devices inside uh, 
for pro sorry the generic uh, simulator can be used to train on the generic process for example um, how distillation works for example uh, how turning a ship can be done okay and then um, the disadvantage cannot use to train in specific plant process because it's generic mm, specific plant like uh, disruptor or pipe burst okay um, and generic uh, cannot be used to train on specific plant uh, integrated control and safety system so it has a very specialized um, for example, ICSS provided by Yokogawa, for example. Uh, so for, for generic, it's probably a mathematical model that you look at the, inside the textbook or a research. Uh, so it's not something that you have um, proprietary from a company. Um, generic can be, cannot be used for plant optimization because it's mostly to familiarization. But replica is mostly like you have digital twin where you can use for plant optimization. Uh, you can increase um, uh, some of the pressure or flow rate to increase the yield, uh, reduce the pressure, see what, how it goes. Um, for generic, it cannot be used for test operating procedures, uh, but for replica, you can do this for all operating procedures. Uh, replica can be used to tune uh, the plant. Okay, And then um, one of the advantage of generic simulator is it can be transported to different locations. So uh, this is something that you can put back inside the bag and then bring it somewhere else. Uh, so this is the advantage of generic ones. But for replica, you cannot because you, you have spent a room uh, or several rooms to create a replica simulator. You cannot bring it uh, either to other place. So it's, it's a fixed building. And then uh, next is fidelity. So simulator have different uh, details levels. Okay, we call it fidelity. Uh, we, we have low fidelity, sometimes they call it tie back. Um, and then we have medium fidelity. Again, and then we have high fidelity. So typically um, for a replica simulator, it's a high fidelity. It's, it can be used for process optimization and can be used for training. It's ultimate, it have everything. Uh, for medium fidelity, you have validation of control, uh, validation of safety, and also alarm philosophies. Um, in some plants, they have uh, their own uh, SOP for standard operating procedure for alarms. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can use medium fidelity for operator familiarization because it's almost look like real. But low fidelity, you can do for static control uh, and safety check out. Uh, like uh, safety uh, checks, okay? Static control is when um, you rely on uh, your readings and also uh, the predetermined output uh, from your supervisors or uh, the machines that uh, you're going to replicate. Okay, uh, the next one is FOD, uh, field operated device. So if you hear the word FOD, uh, so inside of OTS is basically uh, you have all the, all the machines um, all the engines, uh, all the pipelines that you connected to the uh, to the simulator, and see how it goes, how it responds um, based on uh, your current training. Okay. All right. So next, um, what are the companies in the world that build uh, OTS? So you might be familiar with some of these names, ETAP. Aviva, Yokogawa, Genesis. So these are the companies that build OTS uh, in the world. So these, uh, they come with um, ICSS, Integrated Control and Safety uh, System. Uh, and then they come with second package, which is the OTS package. Uh, so Operator Training Simulator and also the Integrated is integrated System. ICSS is basically the, the real model that correspond to that particular machinery. So, um, it correspond uh, wholly. But for us in UMT, we create simulators that mostly for the generic ones um, that based on mathematical model. Uh, we haven't go into detail on the digital twin, uh, although we have started to use artificial intelligence to model uh, turbines and also um, maneuvering of ship uh, to create a digital twins. Now, before you can start developing or designing your own OTS, uh, operator training simulator in your plan. Uh, this is, uh, I would like to reiterate that uh, you need to 
see that there are several package uh, generate simulator which is not customized for example generate fpso simulator generate compressor simulator and this can be used for basic operator or recruit training uh, engineer training and then you have a uh, replica simulator sometimes high fidelity sometimes customized sometimes a faithful translation of real world plants or vehicle so uh, in low fidelity simulator like this one uh, you have hmi human machine interface sometimes we have rudimentary graphics basic graphics and then you can use it for operation produce procedure startup uh, static control checks and also basic logics like duty and standby uh, right so uh, and then medium fidelity simulator has everything from the low fidelity plus operational check alarm studies safety control advanced control basic uh, check practice and for high fidelity it has everything from flow and also medium fidelity uh, they add inside the digital twin so this is um, uh, a very interesting part uh, where you have the machines remotely that uh, react similar as what you have in the simulator. Uh, so this is very good for optimization of the plant outputs, uh, all capabilities, uh, full logic feedbacks, and can be used to train uh, operators and also supervisors. Okay, um, to develop an OTS, um, we use uh, control engineering. Um, during the building of a simulator, uh, supplier and end user need to collaborate to capture all the integrated control and safety system characteristic ICSS. ICSS is the the model that cater for all that you have. For example, um, you, you want to have turbine system, uh, you had you want to have um, uh, gas uh, fire system, uh, and then you need to collaborate with the uh, the the supplier. Okay, if you're the end user. Uh, to build this ICSS for the factory acceptance test FATs. Um, even when the OTS has been delivered, uh, ICSS data, okay, the model that you have, must be continued and carefully documented. Because uh, when you are creating a digital twin, um, your data capture will going to reflect how the digital twin react. So it's, it is a continuous work. Sometimes they use uh, ANN, artificial neural network, uh, to model. Sometimes they have a very specific um, uh, modeling techniques. Um, and then all alarm rationalization must be continuously documented. Uh, all control strategy changes, uh, because you are going to do a lot of maintenance. Uh, you're going to change a lot of things, uh, probably because of the turnaround. Uh, the digital twin needs to be uh, synchronized with um, your real machine. All the changes in the safety system need to be documented. And you're going to notice um, you are going to save a lot of engineering costs by tuning. So if you tune early and often, uh, you're going to ensure that your real plant is not going to break or uh, break down before um, uh, break down prematurely because you have done you can do uh, predictive maintenance because you already have continuous data that you fit in inside of digital twin and then you need to document all lessons learned to be passed to the next project team because once the project has been completed or after certain part you are going to do management of change next is the process engineering so both suppliers and also end user need to work together to capture all the process uh, all the variables and parameter and the reports um, all those data that we receive uh, from the real plant that you fit inside of the OTS need to be validated and um, and all those uh, data need to be approved inside the physical project team um, you have a project team at a site and also project team inside the uh, uh, inside of digital twin so both teams need to um, need to present and also communicate uh, is this right about the response of the digital twin with reflect to the uh, machineries physical machineries and document or lessons learned to be passed on the next project team now we go to the case studies all right so uh, the case study is taken from the uh, OTS handbook um, which is something that I refer a lot um, this year so this is the OTS delivery case study number one it's basically a FPSO 
uh, floating production storage and offloading uh, at the North Sea in UK. Uh, so they have uh, ICSS emulation. Uh, this is by Emerson Delta V. And then they use uh, compressor control by CCC. And model fidelity is high fidelity. Um, the system is provided by Honeywell Unisim, right? So uh, this is a newly built FPSO uh, in the UK North Sea. Uh, they started with the, they, they, they do construction on the FPSO at the same time creating the OTS or digital twin during the construction. However, the digital twin was delivered many months before the first oil, um, where the first start of the, the, of the plant. So one of the good thing about this project is before the first oil is being delivered, all the control room technicians were trained on three levels of training. So they have introductory, startup, and also abnormal operation. Uh, so this is excellent training because before the first oil happens, all the people, the technicians, the, the control room people has achieved the competence level that the, the project required them to have. For example, if anything happens, they know how to react. And then all operation supervisors were trained before the first oil and all operating, operating procedure were validated on the OTS. So which means that what you do at the real plant is similar to what you do in the OTS. Um, and then uh, during the building of the digital twin, around 300 engineering items. Uh, so they have sub items inside of the ICSS under the process were noted and documented uh, for to the project. And then uh, further 200 items were noted during training delivery. Uh, because as, as you proceed with the construction of the real plan, you are going to modify your OTS, modify your digital twin. And then alarm rationalization studies were performed at the OTS. So you can have uh, a trip with blowdown or a trip without blowdown. So which means that uh, when the gas in the plant is released to the flag, you let's try a trip. Uh, so what you are going to do afterwards. Uh, so those are the rationalization studies were performed. Uh, and also uh, a trip without blowdown where the gas is held in the plant under control and then you need to restart the plan quicker than the trip uh, with blowdown. Uh, and also all major equipment trips, uh, for example, uh, main compressor trip, uh, trip of main water injection pump and gas turbine is also being done before the first gas. Um, all control loops were tuned um, between the OTS and the, and the real project. Compressor control were tuned similarly. Uh, the first first start of the FSO we tested with digital twin and model prediction was extremely close to the one from the actual first oil start which is very excellent because um when when you want to experiment with your yield you can do it uh, with the digital twin before you deploy to the real plant and all the savings estimated uh and to have saved the project around seven uh, 17 days of startup time so which means that um, the project that produced more than uh, 100,000 barrels of crude oil, they save it uh, for 17 startup days. So millions of dollars has been saved for this project. Second is the fixed platform. Same in UK North Sea. Um, the ICS simulation is a hybrid Emerson Delta V, compressor control Aspen Tech High Seas, uh, and then model fidelity as Pentec high seas as well. So this project is a newly constructed, it's a green field, high pressure, high temperature gas field uh, for three platforms. Uh, the digital twin has delivered many months and in advance before the first gas. So which means that the team in the, uh, the team that going to get in and uh, start the plant is ready. So all the, um, uh, all the control room officers, CROs, would train on three different levels. Uh, similarly, uh, introductory, uh, startup, and also abnormal operation. And this is achieved before the first crash. So all the competence levels are already there. Uh, all field operators train using uh, two levels, uh, introductory and startup, before the first guess. All the operation supervisors were trained before the first guess. So the operating procedures were validated uh, on the OTS and during the building of the OTS around 50 engineering items were noted and passed on further 100 were noted during the training delivery so which means that 
um, this particular system is very flexible when you can continuously add uh, the items, engineering items, uh, before you are starting the field. Uh, similarly, all the control rooms uh, on the OTS and parameter pass to the project team to use. The, uh, the very first plant start of the project uh, tested on the OTS, so which means that um, the first plant start tested on the OTS and then measured. So you see that there is a very similar uh, response between the digital twin uh, on your model or train simulator and the real plant. So this project produced a uh, gas worth of $2 million a day. So they save about 11 days uh, for the deployment of the, uh, of the plant. So this is a very impressive case study because uh, sometimes uh, when, uh, when we talk to uh, plant, they say that uh, you might going to overshoot uh, for the deployment. So this is happening, uh, you're going to postpone the deployment. So if you have, um, if you don't have any problem with the construction and you have the, um, the expenditure to build an OTS, that would be great because uh, you can straight away train before the first guess, before the first deployment. Now, uh, we understand now, um, historically, when you have OTS and then you have um, the real plan, um, you basically able to train any uh, control room personnel or control room operators beforehand. But since OTS is now very close to the real plant, we need to think outside of the box because um, in real plant, once you have deployed, sometimes OTS is not going to be used. There are lots of issues afterwards, I can assure you, because some of the variables change and then uh, sometimes it doesn't justify the cost of training. Uh, but if you continuously maintain your operating tra uh, operator training sim simulator, like the one we have in UMT is the ship navigation. We never stop using it for training. Uh, we can also use it for experiments. Uh, we can use for uh, plan optimization. We can use it for um, physical studies. So that is thinking outside of the box because since you have a model that correctly correspond to the real world, you can further increase the knowledge of the plan personnel. So your OTS is not going to be left slipping to waste. Uh, the use of OTS is client supplier bug fixes. Um, once you deliver OTS, uh, you cannot let your supplier to go astray uh, because you are the client. You want to make sure that your devices will always be working well. So you need to continuously communicate with the supplier saying that, okay, this needs to be addressed because some of the readings is not matched. Uh, and that can happen. Although with factory acceptance tests, uh, completed, several things need to be addressed. For example, control and safety system, uh, process system, uh, tuning of the integrated control and safety system, uh, chaining automatic sequence of pump compressor turbines uh, to increase the efficiency of the plant because uh, things take time. And then you need to experiment of how to increase the efficiency of the plant by chaining the sequence automatically. Or you are you, once you do a lot of benchmarking and site visits, you notice that there are several control systems that can be tuned for higher efficiency. So change control system is sometimes needed. Uh, other use of OTS is for procedure check, uh, checkouts. So you can record uh, the testing procedure and then uh, making sure that they work by testing them dynamically in, on the OTS. So which means that here you, ha you have uh, item one in area one, two, three, for example, and then the tagging is like this. Um, and then you have the parameters uh, that you note. Uh, initially, the parameter is zero to 150 uh, uh, bar, for example, and then you change it to zero to 280,000. Uh, flow rates, M3 per hour, and direct independent. So depending on your particular uh, situation and your configuration and your date, putting in your name, and then is the result uh, consistent? If it's not, then you need to note this, why you are doing this, because um, 
the value that you have inside of your digital twin is inconsistent okay uh, with the real uh the, with the real turbine for example okay and then uh, put some notes here action by which team and then this is category design and what is the status is it soft and then uh, put here the face uh, sometimes uh, you have running face or integration face uh, depending on your practice uh, put some description and what is the priority and meeting up count so this is very important because uh, once if you are not relying on your your supplier to uh, further maintain your uh, OTS or the uh, digital twin you can also do this as a routine check for example um, is the data captured uh, between the real turbine to your digital twin is consistent if not consistent why uh, and then you need to change the configuration and match this is a manual configuration um, nowadays you can use uh, modeling techniques uh, to do configuration automatically so this is basically an example log sheet template and then the other uh, use of OTS is for control tuning so um, when the ICSS is uh, factory accepted, okay, FAT. You have your PID, so the proportional integral and differential PID. I'm very sure you have uh, uh, know this because you are operating machines uh, with 60 second integrals and 0 0.5 second differential. So you can further tune your plant uh, during commission uh, so, so that you are going to save time for starting, okay? or you can have tools from the ICSS supplier to push the parameter so you have uh, probably you have your own uh, MATLAB, uh, MATLAB uh, calculation or you have your own excel calculation or hand calculation and then feed them to the real system and then um, this is not only uh, applies to controller tuning but also for other equipments like uh, compressor control uh, and then this can be tuned on the OTS uh, back in your uh, OTS in office uh, rather on the site. So you don't have to go to the site, talk to the people inside of your real control room uh, to do this uh, by helicopter or by uh, OSV. So you can just simply do the um, increase of control tuning in the office and then relay this message to the people in the plant. Um, other use of OTS, okay, this is still under the um, thinking outside of the box uh, is for emergency response training. So emergency response training uh, is not necessarily be done uh, by physical. Sometimes emergency response training is to, uh, to measure the level of understanding uh, on what's going on and also to measure the level of communication between teams. So uh, emergency response training is something that we call by uh, response simulator. So we can do uh, response planning, training, and exercise uh, and see the effective response. Uh, if we have uh, personnel that are having an incident, we can do uh, incident mitigation and stabilization, uh, facility process or business recovery, uh, and then return to normal operation. So emergency response training, for example, if you have a team that we're going to handle this, uh, you can use that team inside of the OTS and then have them to uh, to further do their meetings or responding based on this template. Okay, so um, engineering studies, uh, something that uh, we are very wary of when we have personal change uh, inside the control room, okay, something that the Saram skit is when we have someone new comes from different plants, uh, and this is normal. So in any plant, control room is a very sensitive place to be. You cannot have simply once uh, a new person come and then say that, okay, let's change this parameter. Uh, I've experienced this in my plant before this, this is going to increase our yield. Uh, so this is something that we are uh, quite scary to hear <laughs> because some plants have different histories, uh, changes of pH changer and so on. So it, this the in, it, instead of uh, having the, the management of change to do in real plant, you can have these engineering studies based on management of change uh, using ODS or digital twins. So uh, 
if you if you have a digital twin that is well maintained you can have the plant to be safely modified uh, again you can modify uh, what are the pressure level of this particular section and then we can increase uh, what is the uh, percentage of production for example 90 percent let's increase 200 percent so um, we can have the test here uh, inside the OTS and see how it goes uh, especially if you have a replica where a replica simulator have their alarm system uh, they have uh, a lot of trip system uh, so uh, increasing section A we're going to trip uh, section C for example so this is something that uh, can be done inside of the OTS and this is a disconnect right so you you cannot connect this to the real plan when you are doing management of change exercise uh, and this is what we call by data engineering because you disconnect this uh, digital twin from the real plant okay so this is a data collection document template um, and there are lots of templates that you can refer to uh, and this is one of them uh, that calls for typical data and the timing. So, um, for example, uh, you have the process flow diagram uh, and then heat and material balance. Okay, this data is essential. And when, when do we need this data? Uh, prior to the start of the project. So before the start of the project, you need to have process flow diagram. It must be complete. It must be consistent with steady state heat and material balance for the agreed design case uh, for that particular scenario of, of operation. Uh, and it must be consistent with the process simulator. Uh, so this is must be ready beforehand by testing in the process simulator and expected data sheets. And then um, process and instrumentation diagram, PIDs, this is essential. Uh, when this is needed, this is needed during the kickoff meeting, the KOM. So a full set of plan, uh, process, and instrumentation diagram, plus any supplier PIDs. Uh, if you have other full set, it must be full set and re relevant supplier PID. Um, I believe if you work in a petrochemical plant, you have lots of documents that relies to this with all the clouds connecting to the next documents. So this is very tricky, but nowadays uh, it's digital. Uh, plus you can have buttons inside so um, it is important to use the same PID that are supplied with the integrated control system with the simulator model uh, and then compressor performance process and mechanical data sheets uh, this is essential so prior to the start of modeling uh, and also typically two months before key of meeting so uh, if you have compressor uh, be it centrifugal or axial all the process mechanical design data that considered must be having the right uh, maybe having the tally data uh, be it suction volumetric flow polytropic head uh, efficiency varying speeds um, can it go beyond operator training uh, can we have it 150 percent operation uh, 150 percent rpm um, and the number of cylinder uh, dimension of cylinder it must all tally with the uh, real world and then uh, heat exchanger process and mechanical data sheet. This is essential. Uh, this is typically one month before key of meeting. Uh, and all this process design data, including duty area, film collect coefficient, uh, tube, side tube side volumes, uh, all the uh, orientation and location of the instrument must be there. Uh, vessel data sheet, typically one month before key of meeting. So vessel type, dimension, normal operating condition, instrument, uh, uh, and all the drawings where possible. So if you look at this data collection document template, this is basically on the detailed design stage. Uh, some of you might going to ask, okay, is this during the conceptual design stage or preliminary or the detail? Uh, definitely this is for the detailed design stage. And this is the training requirement template. So uh, re training requirement plan template is you have uh, number one start here with training philosophy. Uh, so you, you need to measure the training experience, uh, the area of the process, the simulator scope, uh, period and availability. And then uh, try to do scoping, uh, identify training needs, okay? And also the schedule, uh, aims and objectives. And then um, 
go to the training course. So fundamentals, it can be introductory, like the case study introductory, immediate, advanced, and the first gas or first oil uh, production, and then validation. Uh, based on all those training courses, can we see that all the technicians are very familiar with the control scheme, very familiar with the operating procedure, very familiar with the plant performance. And when the plant trips, uh, alarms goes off, uh, do they familiar with what to do afterwards? And then evaluation and feedback and quantifying the benefits. So this is during the closing of the training. So uh, it can have a uh, lots of modules and also scenario. You can have uh, self-paced modules and also silent hours training. So when people are um, trying to run the situation similar to uh, the real situation. All right, so next. Okay, uh, now we are going to the recap of the presentation. Uh, so we are almost uh, end of the time. So the future of OTS. Okay, traditionally, okay, I go to the traditional. Um, when big companies like Aviva and also Honeywell, uh, when they do the OTS, they have two package. Um, is number one, the OTS package. Number two is the ICSS package. Okay, um, and these two package have different pricings. ICSS um, can be several, uh, I'm not so sure, uh, based on my reading, it can be up to uh, 100 millions, but for OTS, it can be an order of magnitude uh, of 10 millions. So the OTS and ICSS is it, two different package, but uh, nowadays, people can have both as one package. So OTS that typically have smaller budget can be packaged directly into one package. So when this is package that we call by digital twin. So a holistic package that can be used again and again because the risk of OTS is it may be abandoned. Um, so we've seen some of the uh, simulator being abandoned uh, for several years. And when they come back to the simulator, things doesn't work. So that can happen much more, um, more expensive. Next, the future of operator trains, uh, uh, operating uh, system. Uh, so operator training uh, simulator is to move to the cloud. So when we try to move to the cloud, um, your OTS or operator training simulator is hosted in the user's facility, the interface in your site, but the physics, or the ICSS is hosted in the supplier's facility. So this is something that uh, you uh, you don't need to worry about. Um, you don't need to worry about having to always make sure that ICSS is updated because this will going to be done by uh, the supplier. Your interface is just interface. Uh, so you just make sure you just need to communicate with the supplier because you are subscribed, saying that um, the ICSS must tally with my physical plant. My physical plant must send all the signals to your server, and your server must be capable to continuously, um, to continuously retraining your model. Okay, retraining your model, say for example, uh, because machineries, they are getting old, and uh, the inputs and outputs are uh, going to be different at certain percentage and also there will be some vibrations uh, problems that you need to take um, preventive maintenance into account okay that's basically the two, po the two points that i would like to highlight on the future of ots okay next all right so all right so we are approaching the end okay now uh, i would like to recap uh, or do some takeaway home message. All right. So number one, uh, you might be a simulator developer. All right. Because you have used the Excel documents, uh, probably you calculate all the input and outputs. This is a, a replica of the petrochemical plant in a form of mathematical modeling. Uh, so you might be one of them. And then simulator has been around since early 1900s. Okay. So this is not new. Uh, it has been around. Uh, our grandfathers already think about it. Uh, so very interesting. 
uh, simulators can be generic or specialized depending on the user's requirement. Okay. Uh, and then simulators can be used to train operators, conduct data engineering. You can use simulator to kickstart a plant okay, for, for the training and also to handle management of change. And then um, the current state of the art of simulator is digital twin. Okay, I think you have heard about this. Um, I, I don't want to say the word IR 4.0 because you might hear this again and again, but without saying IR 4.0, you know that uh, your machine can be replicated as a model that you can further optimize to increase your efficiency. Uh, or to prevent uh, breakdown using preventive maintenance. And another one that I think we need to put inside our mind is uh, the future of simulator is going to be cloud-based or software as a service. Uh, this is very important point because um, I, we don't want to adopt a simulator and have all those uh, hardwares that are going to be updated in the next three years. Um, and then it, came, it come with the responsibility to create a space office space or lab space or uh, plant space that is very premium nowadays, uh, constructions. We just want to have interface and then digital twin that are valid. So software as a service is the future. All right. So uh, I put inside the handout, the references, sources, uh, if you are interested to read. Uh, I think this is a very interesting book, Operator Training Simulator Home Handbook. And some of the uh, handout by ABB, uh, I assess this in, this is in March of 2023. And some of the work that I uh, cite here is from MATLAB. Some of the figures is, are not mine, is Google search that referred to the respective owners. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, I return the stage to IR Mike. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, yeah, uh, based on the question, I think we have a few questions posted there. Uh, if you yeah. can read it, uh, alternatively, I could read from you as well. Um, the first question from uh, Mr. Kelvin. He was asking, uh, in your opinion, are industries in Malaysia ready to adopt digital twin technology? Are we ready? Okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you so much, IR Mike. So this is a very interesting question, uh, and we ha we have been uh, discussing about uh, digital twin uh, again and again uh, with a very small um, very small crowd. Uh, I would say that uh, it's still a, a long long way to go uh, because I'm not talking about uh, Malaysia in specific. Uh, I'm talking about the 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 whole the whole global uh, the global uh, practice, because uh, digital twin is is a continuous thing, and you are going to use a lot of sensors. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, legacy plants, uh, not new plants, uh, for brownfield plants, the plants is that already old. Um, they they don't have a lot of sensors in their machines. Uh, their sensors are limited to the flow rate, uh, limited to the RPM. But uh, in order for a digital twin to really work out well, it needs to have more additional sensors like um, uh, the accelerometers to see the level of vibration of the rotating machines. Um, when we say rotating machines, uh, they indicate that the machines with that particular mass, with that particular um, bolting uh, on the foundation, uh, we can predict that the rotate the rotation the rotating will going to hit the natural frequency. So from that natural frequency, we are saying that okay, preventive maintenance need to be now, um, or uh, through digital twin, we can have data collected after the run or before the run. Uh, and then we can straight away indicate the schedule uh, of the maintenance. And this is going to be do, done automatically. Uh, as of now, uh, the precursor for uh, Digital Twin is already here. Uh, I, 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 I dare to say that the precursor is already here because um, machineries at plants already have uh, installed with a lot of sensors. And all these sensors we're going to fit in, in online. 
So it's just a matter of time when we hook all this sensor reading to a machines that able to model the whole thing and report when to do uh, maintenance. So yeah, in, in, in general, Malaysia is, has a precursor towards that, uh, but still, still uh, a, a lot of work to do uh, for um, teaching and also uh, try to, to have people to understand about the digital twin. Right, right, right. I think it's a good answer. Uh, next, uh, we have an, a question from uh, from our attendees. Uh, what are the difference between training simulator like ship handling simulator compared to simulator used for validation of results finding? Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, so the question here about um, training simulator, the replica ones, okay. So we have replica, replica ship simulator. Uh, replica ship simulator uh, in, for example, in UTM or in UMT or even in UNIKL MIMAT uh, or even in, uh, in, uh, in Westport, okay? So there are several uh, real ship and simulator. Um, second, yeah, that's number one, the, the replica one. Second is simulator used for validation of research finding. Okay, simulator used for research finding can be um, CFD based, uh, can be empirically based, the one that you measure in towing tank, uh, and then you come back and then you train it to create a mathematical model, be it using uh, analytical equation, uh, using regression, or using artificial neural network. Okay, so I would say that um, these two uh is related okay uh but for the one in replica we mainly use to measure the response of the operators the one that we have uh in uh, in the lab uh for example in cfd is for the design of new craft and where this going to be merged uh, this is going to be merged once we have the uh, simulator, replica simulator. When we install the uh, the lab designed uh, hull or vessel, uh, and then see how uh, the response will work. Uh, so the differences is mostly on the interface uh, and also uh, the difference in uh, fidelity. I would say that uh, the lab uh, sorry, the, the, the lab-based simulator, uh, in the CFD ones that you have in your desktop, is much more higher fidelity than uh, on the uh, replica simulator. Uh, because replica simulator, uh, we need to do a lot of sacrifice um, because we are dealing with uh, graphics and also real-time response. Uh, we cannot afford to have uh, real-time response uh, for CFD. is going to be very, very expensive. Right, right. Thank you very much for the uh, for the answer. Um, okay, the next question would be, uh, I think, very quick one. Uh, how typically the simulator being validated or benchmark um, before uh, a real used? Okay, um, for audits. Okay, for audits. Uh, basically, we are referring to, uh, for example, BV documents. Okay, for example. I don't remember what kind of documents that we use. I think BV. Uh, all right. So uh, there are American Bureau of Shippings. Okay. They have mathematical model inside. And so also BV, they have their own mathematical ins uh, model inside. So we are referring to that document. And then uh, we create our mathematical model inside the simulator. If, okay, if we hit the same answer as what we see in the uh, ISO, sorry, not ISO, in the uh, in the guidelines, then we say that our simulator is fit to model uh, the industrial uh, application. Uh, so that's that's the the surface part. Um, I haven't had any experience on uh, on the on the more auditing side uh, because at this stage uh, we are more towards the response training. So response training is as long as you have a mathematical model that have the same feel 
that you audit with the captain or operators, then you are good enough to go uh, because this is a basically uh, a much uh, lower magnitude cost uh, compared to the one that we get from Kongsberg. Uh, so that's basically how we validate using guidelines. Uh, and then they anyhow, when they come, they are going to use the same uh, documents to audit us. Right, right. Uh, the next question would be, um, what is the typical simulator being offered in particular in Malaysia and in which industry? Okay, um, this is, I'm very comfortable talking about this. <laughs> okay, so um, if you look around uh, Malaysia, um, most of the simulators are being put inside institutes. Um, and for, for example, in uh, UPNM, uh, they have a simulator to teach their cadets on how to approach ports, uh, how to safely navigate uh, their ship. This is similar to UMT. Uh, we have a ship simulator uh, to train uh, captains uh, and also their practitioners. Uh, this is real captains. Uh, they are that are going to approach the, the, the real ports. Uh, and then they set a very specific scenario uh, during a very specific date. Uh, because during that date, they are going to have a weather forecast uh, wind forecast and then using wind forecast we can have uh, the wave modeling so wave modeling typically we use Pearson Moscovitz because we can model the sea states using the wind speed uh, so that's the typical ones that we have and uh, I have visited UTP uh, and I've seen petrochemical um, process uh, simulator uh, they have both uh, the replica plants and also the control room plants um, but as far as, for example, uh, if, if we take um, our national uh, oil and gas company, Petronas, um, as far as I notice now, they are, um, they, are, uh, in, in, they are investing in response simulator. So response simulator, um, the company that created this is VSTEP. So, uh, it's basically a simulator where you can put all the elements inside of a stage. Uh, you can simulate fires and then you can have the correspondence to do everything uh, to complete the scenarios. Uh, so that is the extent of the use of simulator. It's, it's still in the uh, operator training site. Uh, it's not moving towards digital twin as of yet. Uh, that's uh, my observation. Okay, I've got uh, for perhaps the last question. Um, uh, they were asking, uh, what is the general ballpark figures in terms of dollar and cent? Okay, uh, okay. to have a sensible simulator, and what is the timeline uh, in order uh, uh, for 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 anybody to commission um, the the simulator with regard to the industry in general? Okay. In general, or in general, it's yeah. very hard because my exposure is mostly on the ship <laughs> navigation. Okay, <laughs> uh, but okay, uh, just telling you um, experience. Um, the ballpark figure uh, is depending on your complexity. Um, the ballpark figure is uh, from one million to five millions. Uh, so, for a simulator that takes oh, about. Sorry, uh, Malaysia, yeah. Ringgit Malaysia, yes, Ringgit okay, Malaysia. <laughs> so, so that's the the ballpark. It can increase uh, if you uh, if you add more fi uh, more more features or more modules. That's number one. Uh, this can increase if you just um, beginning to construct your building. Uh, that adds more, uh, twenty three million for a building. <laughs> okay, but if your building is ready, uh, and then you have um, quarter of the floor that you can use, for example, what is the quarter of the floor? Uh, let me see, about 1,000 to 1,500 square feet. Uh, you can use this uh, for the um, for the simulator stage, and then you have the instructor stage. Uh, so that ballpark from one to five million uh, ringgit Malaysia. But for oil and gas, I think it's much more higher. If you look at the handbook, um they 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 put the number up to 100 uh 1 100 100 uh, million 
100 million. So 100 million, I think this is uh, complete with the digital twin because you are talking about uh, you are talking about Yokogawa. We are going to talk about Aspen Tech. So uh, those comes with a very high fidelity uh, uh, integrated control and safety system, very complete. So it goes to that numbers. Right, 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 right. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Dolo and Sen, yeah, some of the participants here, they are, they are from industry. So uh, I would believe that, well, dollar dollar sign is one of the big issue when uh, you are embarking into this kind of uh, uh, work and activities. Yeah. Right. Do we yeah. have any other question then? Uh, chuk, 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 chuk. No, I don't think so that we have anything yet. Uh, right, 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 right. So, any activity at this moment at uh, at your university uh, uh, with regard to this simulation work, research, okay. or, you know? Um, so, um, now the university is pushing towards uh, producing uh, based on research, right? So, we, we, we noticed that um, both uh, international and also local players, they are heading to the same stage, the same level. When we say that, um, uh, for example, in UK, if they can do mathematical model, we can do this locally as well. Um, with this uh, stage being set, uh, Malaysia is heading on towards creating product as well. So, which means that we are no longer a consumption comp uh, consumption country. We are moving towards being a production country. So, with this in mind, uh, what we are doing in campus is uh, to engage with industries and to create products that reflect this because the mathematical model is there uh, the the prog programming capability the software hardware integration is there it's just a matter of repackaging this and then sell it out um, and this is uh, something that continuously being done now where we engage and we deliver um, uh, and one of the things that i think uh, being um, being completed here now is the ROV simulator. So remotely operated underwater vehicle. So this is something that our group is still working on. Uh, and this is something that we intend to launch during uh, Lima. Uh, if you are keen, yeah, please, please come to visit uh, UMT booth in Lima, inshallah. Oh yeah, perhaps last uh, another last question. There is another question from another. Um, he was asking on uh, any opportunity for uh, any postgraduate studies, you know, uh, with regard to uh, this research work in 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 the university. Okay. Um, and and also for... the, the 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 prerequisite for the candidates to be involved into the work. Okay, so postgraduate typically you need to have undergraduate degree. Uh, that is if you go into masters. Uh, if you want to go for PhD, you need to have minimum, uh, you need to have, yeah, undergrad, you can convert that to PhD during your master's. Uh, that's number one. Second, um, if you are keen to do research uh, with regard to simulator, uh, I've uh, observed several, um, several professionals, captains, uh, who are doing research based on simulator. Um, when we do research based on simulator, it's not necessarily to build a simulator because building a simulator is very expensive uh, exercise but i see captains when they use simulator they are studying on the strategic ways to maneuver um, and the one that we uh, we observe uh, in swiss um, uh, uh, in swiss right so you have a ship that stuck uh, in the uh, in the river okay so uh, from that they use it as uh, the starting benchmark to study how to mitigate that situation, that's number one, or before that, how to prevent that from happening. So basically, it comes from different courses. For example, uh, the captains who are not aware, um, the, uh, the, the, turning, uh, the turning angle uh, that doesn't fit with that particular situation. Uh, so those are the kind of uh, studies that is being done. It's mostly for uh, safety, uh, increase of safety uh, in navigation. That's for ships. <laughs> but if you are from oil and gas, also you can do that. Uh, basically, you can study 
uh, if there is anything um, that that uh, with regard to incidents, uh, you can replicate that incidents and you can further track backtrack uh, on how that incidents probably will work. It's like a CSI kind of thing. So typically for practi practitioners like yourself uh, in the industry, it's mostly to document the root causes of why something is happening. Right. Uh, is there any any joint industry project at this moment uh, being carried out uh, at your end over there in university? Um, there are several projects that we are doing uh, and mostly relate to data, uh, how to present data well, because uh, I think for industry, they have lots of data already uh, and they want to rearrange in the form of um, a software that they can use again and again uh, for uh, preventive maintenance and also for modeling. Uh, so this is on our end. Um, our part is mostly relates to oil and gas and also um, ocean engineering, naval architecture, uh, weather prediction. So there are lots of uh, projects is happening uh, here in UMT, uh, be it from institutes or from the startup companies, uh, especially from uh, startup companies. We have one particular startup that work on um, uh, on weather prediction. So that's very interesting thing that they are doing with the industry. You can engage. Uh, yeah, we welcome any uh, practitioners to engage with us and can do some engagement, see if we can solve any of industry problem uh, and work forward for that. Okay, good, good, great. This is just one of the, the big, big one, one of the issues that always highlighted uh, by, by industry at this moment in time. Because I think uh, when we come to the data, in industry, they, they have a lot of, they have plenty of uh, uh, data, but uh, on the other hand, uh, they, they need another party who can look, you know, and, and could 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 uh, 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 regress, uh, uh, the, whichever that's possible. Um, is there any question? Chuk, chuk, chuk. What time we are? We are now 4.41. We have another few minutes. Uh, did I get any any flag from from my colleague uh yeah they said it okay any more question any more question any more question okay any final say perhaps from you before we end up okay. before we end up all right uh before we have, uh, end the, the session uh, i hope that everyone uh have a takeaway home on what simulator is um, and get the confidence on what simulator we're going to contribute to your industry. Um, and then um, just, just be aware that you probably have built simulator yourself. Uh, so it's not nothing, it's nothing alien about simulator. Um, and it's just a matter of representation and also the dynamics. Uh, so the fidelity of the dynamics, if you keen to have uh, more details or less details. Sometimes when we work inside the industries, they're talking about ballparks. Uh, they're not necessarily wanting to have a very detailed because anyhow you're going to miss 10% up or miss 10% down. It's okay. But as long as you're, you have an educated guess, then it's fine. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for the session. This is my chance to continue from the previous uh, last year seminar and I hope to come back. Great, thank great, you. great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, just to confirm, your presentation material is accessible for the attendees, right? I confirm that. Yeah, I put the reference so, as well. Yeah, so for those who are, are interested to have this presentation material, you could uh, follow up with our secretariat. Then they will send to you immediately on that. Uh, finally, but not the least, uh, I wish to thanks to Prof. Dr. Mohammad Faisal. Uh, I think it is very honored for your presentation. And I hope that you can share other other technical talks as well in the future. And I hope this is not the last for you. Okay. And I, I wish to thanks to everybody, especially our attendees today, for for uh, willing to to, to participate uh, uh, within within uh, uh, our session today. Um, okay. But last but not the least, uh, please keep up uh, uh, with the IEM website and um for for any our subsequent activities yep so again uh, many thanks uh for the attendees bye all right see you bye bye yep.